I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Good morning. I uh, this has been a, a video series I've been um, well planning for a long time. Actually, probably as long as I've been making videos on YouTube, I've wanted to hit this topic um, because you know I'm afraid quadruple G nailed me. I'm a pervert. Well, I, no, I like I had mentioned in an earlier video, my my master's research um, and part of my PhD research is in uh, sexual biology, um, specifically of crustaceans, but I've knowledgeable on a wide variety of areas. So I want to make a video. I want to make this I want to make a series on on sexual biology. Um I plan on basically targeting the whole animal kingdom and probably even some plants and proteins and fungi as well. Um because this whole subject is fascinating to me. Um and I um, so I just thought I'm going to make a video just as an introduction to what what I want to get at. I'm I'm going to at least in the beginning Avoid uh, human sexual biology, um, and the reason why there's a reason why this the organization of it is, is I want to get some key concepts. This is going to be an educational series, in part, but also a kind of a uh, you know gallery of the weird. Uh, I'm going to present some of the really strange things. I'm going to talk about um, the evolution of anisogamy in the first place, which is the big question: the, how did the sexes evolve? If you um, those of you who follow creationist uh, literature, creationist uh, things, you'll see they often talk about how did the male and female evolve, They, you know, um, and and the straw man that they make about that is laughable, um, but it, I'm going to talk about how male and female did evolve. Um, it's extremely well understood, um, since um, one of the beauties of that is that we actually have living examples where each of those steps along the way exists in nature um, exists in a continuum and that's a that's a beautiful thing um, so anyway uh, this that's this the topic of the series so like one of the things what I again back to human what I would like to do is I would sort of like to present what I do talk get to human biology human sexual biology is I want to present it sort of in like I don't know if the words the third species I want to present it in the context of that I'm presenting all of the other species that I'm talking about, okay? You know, in other words, not really clouded as po as much as possible by social things. Just purity as if an outside observer is studying the mating behaviors, the sexual biology of another species. So I'm going to talk about a lot of papers. Um, I've got a ton of papers on the subject on human and otherwise. And I'm going to talk, you know, some of the social issues. And I, I think it could be a huge, and I'll organize all of them when I'm done, when I'm not done, when I get a couple down under my belt. Probably the wrong choice of terms. I'm going to organize them into a uh, you know video series, you know, so a playlist, so that we'll you know that that'll make it. I don't know. I think it'd be a lot of fun. I think there's some really fun topics here. It was always when I was teaching um, at a college level or even at a high school level. You know, I I almost whatever topic I found that sort of the key to to hooking. You know, your audience is. I followed uh, what's this, John Waters. If anybody's familiar with the director John Waters, um, Pink Flamingos. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, sorry, I don't know why they suddenly escaped me. Pecker. Um, anyway, the reason uh, hairspray. That's that's what I was trying to think of. Anyway, he has a great quote that I love. Um, it's referring to movies, but I apply it to my lectures in college. Um, which was, he said, how does it go? I always put sex and violence in my movies. That way, even if they're not any good, someone will want to watch them. And I, my talks, I mean, I talk about, I, I can talk about, you know, ca the carbon load in, in, in estuarine systems. But if I can somehow tie that to sex or violence, something gross, talk about, you know, intestinal parasites or something that ties that together. I noticed the kids go from like that to actively taking notes. So, you know, it, 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 I've introduced that into a lot of my talks. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a ramble on my teaching style, um, which is not the purpose of this. Um, like, for example, one of the things, just to sort of to tie like 
as an example of what I'd like to discuss, um, there's been a whole series of great papers. Uh, ever since, it's kind of started with a little bit, it, it's been going on for a long time, but it really, I think the study of human sexual biology really took off um, in the 90s, um, where a series of papers by a, Be um, Baker and Bellis is one of them, and a few others, uh, there were, they started looking at, because we have, we had from the 60s through the 70s accumulated a really good, good body of, of these papers. This, this whole sociobiology, whether you agree with it or not, led to a slew of papers uh, looking at um, the evolution of mating strategies in the animal kingdom, the uh, really trying to concept getting an idea as as to looking at game theory evolutionary stable strategies why certain behaviors persist why behaviors that seem counter to the, the survival of the individual actually do persist and looking at this and then finding trends in the sexual behavior even the aberrant sexual behavior in this group compared to their social organization how large is their social group are they are they single pairs that live together are they solitary do they live in groups of 50 do they live in groups of 100 these kinds of things and finding that whether we look at African lions or chimpanzees or termites we find common threads that run through these depending on some of these and so let a lot of um, idea that there's, that there's a genetic component to these sexual behaviors that is stable, that persists because it's um, advantageous. And then, with that in mind, people started turning the microscope towards human beings, and we find that despite the fact that we're an unusual species, um, we are not unusual in our sexual behavior uh, for the most part. We fall right into where you would expect any other animal species given our reproductive, you know, the, the, our lifespan, our reproductive output, our social conditions, we are sexually right in the thick of it, right? We're, we're right where we ex would expect to be. Um, and, and so they started applying that. And it got a lot of people really uncomfortable because there's a lot of aspects of human sexual biology that people don't, aren't comfortable with. Like, uh, one example is the looking at uh, infidelity. Um, uh, we we are unfortunately or fortunately or whatever I guess biologically um, we are a, a cheating primate um, we are kind of designed to cheat um, that doesn't mean it's right I'm not talking any about morality or ethics I'm talking about biologically um, uh, human females have a for example it's been one of the studies that was done and I'll, I'll showcase this one in one of my talks later on when um, there was a study done where they looked at um, what human females found attractive, what kind of man human females were attracted to. And they did a study with hundreds and hundreds of individuals. And they looked at the scale of male types, which were created artificially with computers, from a kindly feminine type to a robust, hardcore Schwarzenegger male type. And this continuum in between them and they had women choose which one they found the most attractive. Um, and they, they found the ultimate result of the study and it, it worked across cultures is that women preferred the more effeminate males, more softer males throughout most of their reproductive cycle until ovulation when they preferred the robust male. W what that says is, you know, I mean, the, what you can interpret it with how you want, but the point of it is, is that there is a what women find sexually attractive in human males is not consistent across their reproductive period. That shows that there's something, there's something there. That's kind of stuff. So anyway, I'm going to get into that. I don't want, I'm going to run out of time here. Um, and this is just an introduction. And I talk about a lot of things. There's a tons of studies now on human mate guarding. Um, the way that men protect at a party, for example, you know, like hidden, sort of hidden camera studies where they watch how men block if there's another male that they perceive as a threat, they actually will, and they don't remember doing it, stand in front of the woman and continuously block at a party. And then when questioned on it, they have no idea that they did so. They don't consciously remember it. And when actually questioned about the, the male who was part of the study, the man invariably 
didn't remember anything about them except for some derogatory term. He looked homosexual to me. He, whatever, there's something that made the male less of a threat. It, it, it's fascinating stuff. So anyway, I gotta go. Uh, talk to you later.